this particular video will discuss comets, their structure and uh, their source. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, begin that. As we uh, look at photographs of comets, we find that there is a coma, there is a dust tail, and a gas tail. The gas tail is, consists of ionized gases from the comet. When the ice is melt, that gas comes off and uh, the sun's ultraviolet light will ionize that and then the solar wind will stretch that uh, gas tail pointed away from the sun. The dust tail comes from dust particles, silicate particles that are embedded in the ice and those come off as the ice is melt and the dust goes into its orbit around the sun. The sunlight does push on the uh, dust. Halley's Comet, uh, 1910 photo here. This comet is called a short period comet. It's the brightest of the short period comets. Short period means period less than 200 years. Someone just thought that would be a nice boundary. Uh, there are other characteristics of the short period comets. The short period comets have orbits a little bit closer to the ecliptic than the long period comets. So a little bit more confined to the ecliptic, but not totally confined. I think it's something like 30 degrees is uh, of inclinations are possible and still have a short period comet. Halley's Comet has uh, been observed since 240 BC. It's the first record that uh, is uh, a confirmed observation of Halley's Comet, 240 BC, and every 76 years roughly since then it's been observed. Halley's Comet has been visited by a spacecraft. The European Space Agency um, spacecraft flew by and took photos of the nucleus of uh, Halley's Comet. From Earth we can't see the nucleus, it's too small, and also when the comet is near the Sun then the coma obscures the view of the nucleus. But uh, successful mission flying past Halley's Comet to view the nucleus. There have been other comets that have been visited, well, Comet Borley, Comet Wild 2, and then this is a drawing of the uh, visit of the spacecraft at the Comet Temple 1 and called Deep Impact. Its purpose was to release a metal uh, object and let it slam into the comet and spray out uh, gases that then would be analyzed. So the impact did occur. There are photographs of the uh, uh, impact with the comet. It was a good hit and the material spread out and was analyzed and showed a little bit more of the silicate material like sand than uh, perhaps what, than what was expected. So there's been kind of a, a drift in uh, categories. The asteroids are known to have some ices on them. They're not just pure rocks. The comets are known to have some rocky type material, although a lot of ice material of course uh, to generate the big tails as they warm up and go past the sun. Um, we've also, you know, space agencies have also returned uh, particles from a comet. So what is amazing about this is if a spacecraft is just flying by a comet, not going into orbit around it, but flying by, uh, it flies by at over 20,000 miles an hour. So how will the spacecraft, how did it, catch particles, dust and sand particles from the comet, if those particles are going to hit at 25,000 miles an hour, won't most particles just be obliterated, vaporized even, by that collision? Well, this Stardust mission used something called aerogel. It's something, uh, just you can think of it as lighter than jello, and mostly air, but as the uh, particles came in, they had a soft collision with this material and they gradually lost energy until they embedded themselves in the aerogel and then that was uh, returned to Earth uh, as the spacecraft came back to uh, back to Earth. So we do have a return of materials from a comet with this uh, Stardust mission. Um, now we've already in a previous video talked about the tails, the dust tail and the gas tail, so I'm not going to uh, do much with those again. Um, here we have some orbits being illustrated for the Comet Temple 1, that was the Deep Impact mission, and Comet Hartley. So the same spacecraft that uh, had the uh, Deep Impact mission was uh, 
sort of revitalized and reused for another mission to fly by the comet Hartley 2. And it could do this with uh, you know, some navigation being involved here as it flew by the Comet Temple 1 in 2005 and then later 2010 had an encounter with the Hartley 2. So there were some uh, flybys of the Earth in just a nice targeted way that uh, gave the spacecraft a little course correction and allowed it to uh, encounter uh, the Comet Hartley 2. So as it flew by, again moving over 20,000 miles an hour, uh, you take digital pictures perhaps and some of them might come out blurry because you moved your hand. The engineers who built this spacecraft built the camera in a special way such that it could track objects while flying by at high speed. So moving past it over 20,000 miles an hour we have a photograph here of the comet nucleus that's not too blurry considering you're moving at 25,000 miles an hour and you can see on the comet's uh, surface where the uh, comet activity is taking place. There's streams of gas coming off and dust as it uh, gets warmed up and material is leaving the comet. And kind of an interesting, kind of a dumbbell type shape with a smooth area in between. Um, and then most recently, 2014, as I record this video, uh, the European Space Agency, the Rosetta mission, and the Filet, uh, lander to this comet. Now, the comet is called 67P. It was discovered in 1969. P means short period and it's the 67th in the list. Uh, I, I believe that's the way it works. And there are two uh, individuals who discovered this. Unfortunately, I cannot pronounce their names. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, but we see the comet surface here. We see impact craters. And kind of, you know, to me, kind of resembles modeling clay that someone has kind of smoothed over with their fingers. And again, there's this kind of smooth region in between two lumps. Um, and then September 10th, as the Rosetta spacecraft was orbiting this comet, we have here some, uh, they've increased, did some image processing to enhance the dim features, but some comet activity as ices were melting and streams of gas, thin streams, were coming off of uh, the comet. So the landing took place on November 12th of 2014. This is a, a drawing of what the intent was. And the intent was to have this lander come down at about one mile an hour, uh, slowly approach the surface, and as it got to the surface it would try to anchor itself uh, with foot screws, with some harpoons, and a thruster here to push down as the harpoons are fired out. Um, unfortunately didn't quite work as well as was planned and it appears that the lander bounced off of the uh, surface and as it bounced the comet rotated and where the lander came down was unfortunately in a shadow region so it could not recharge its solar panels. There's some hope in the future that uh, as this comet gets closer to the Sun um, right now it's approaching the Sun, but I think August of 2015 it will have its perihelion and uh, hopefully there will be more light available and the, the batteries will recharge for this and there will be more science done by this object. It is resting on the uh, surface of the, uh, of the asteroid right now. So when the uh, uh, touchdown occurred, evidently it disturbed some dust. You can see kind of a uh, disturbance region here. And then it bounced up, and the spacecraft is in the air right now. I don't say air. It's above the surface of the comet right now. And there's the shadow uh, on the surface of the comet. So it went up like a half mile and then came back down and maybe bounced again another time and finally came to rest. But unfortunately resting in a shadow region. Um, but it was, it was a touchdown. It was a landing. And they have some science that's data that's still being analyzed as I record this video. Um, comets do death, have death, fall apart. And they can fall apart due to uh, gravitational tidal effects from the Sun or Jupiter, uh, split into several pieces. Or indication that the comet nucleus is not strong. It's not real solid. It's a little bit tenuous. And uh, that uh, can lead to a breakup when we get uh, sort of a big release of uh, 
of gas and ice and dust from the uh, from the comet object, but next time around the sun it won't show up because it will be all dispersed. Um, so comet death. As the orbits of comets are analyzed, again there are two groups, the short period comets and the long period comets. The short period comets evidently have a source in what's called the Kuiper Belt. This is a region beyond Neptune. Uh, Pluto orbits in this belt, the region beyond Neptune, and it's a little bit of a disk shape. It's not completely spherical. As objects uh, move in here, their orbits can be disturbed by Neptune and Uranus, um, or they might have an encounter with another comet-sized object in the Kuiper belt, and consequently get bumped and become uh, take on a path that moves them closer to the sun where they can warm up and uh, form a tail. Generally that takes uh, inside the orbit of Mars to get the comet warm enough to uh, melt the ices and form a tail. The long period comets, long period, have bigger orbits and the aphelions that are calculated for their orbit put them out you know, beyond 5,000 astronomical units. Uh, so I think Pluto is 40 astronomical units, don't quote me on that, but um, we're talking very much further out in the solar system. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft is somewhat over 100 astronomical units away from the Sun, and it's been traveling you know, since a little bit before 1980, so 35 years or so. In 35 years, it's gone a little over 100 astronomical units. Um, how long would it take to go 5,000 AUs? So it's gone 100 in uh, 35 years. It could go 1,000 roughly in 350 years. And five times that, so we're talking you know, 1,600 years. Um, that's a rough calculation. It's not quite right because the Voyager spacecraft is slowing down. As it moves away from the sun, the sun's gravity is still pulling on it. And it is escaping from the sun, but it is slowing down as it moves away. So we're talking probably 2,000 years to uh, for this spacecraft to get uh, to this distance. It will not be operational at that time. And maybe we'll have better uh, rocket travel uh, for the Earth civilization at that time that can uh, overtake the Voyager spacecraft and get out to this region and explore the second source of comet material called the Oort cloud. This is spherical around the sun. It's uh, loosely held by the sun's gravity. And again, objects in here can get disturbed, bumped towards the, uh, the sun, and become a comet as they come in, race in, and then race back out. And long period comets, you can do the calculation if you want with p squared equals a cubed, and put in 5,000 or 10,000 for the value of a, and you'll come up with an extremely large number for the, the period of the comet. Um, the comets from the Oort cloud come in in all directions, some in the same direction that the planets orbit the sun, some in the opposite direction. And they come in at all angles to the ecliptic. So they're uh, not really organized in a, in a sense of uh, like the short period comets are. The short period comets have orbits closer to the ecliptic plane. Um, the Kuiper belt is a belt, not a sphere. And we have a, a situation, and I just noticed this, whoever made this graphic, um, this is Kuiper belt. And it might have been yours truly who uh, put that label in there. But anyway, we have the, uh, the Oort cloud, a spherical distribution of comet type material, um, very much further out than the Kuiper belt. So that's where I'm going to, uh, to end this particular video. I hope that you keep reading and asking questions and uh, uh, keep studying.